Welcome back to our series on Romans. Uh, we're working our way through this a theologically rich book. And Paul is building some arguments, we said, as we go through here. Uh, just to kind of remind you, let's put it up here, this sort of chart. We started by talking about the fact that everyone knows there is a God and that their sins deserve death. He talked about that in chapter 1, and then he started building some arguments on top of that, God is going to judge everyone according to their works, and he's going to do it impartially. And then God's judgment will be nuanced and tempered by one's level of understanding of God's law. We saw that last week. And so he's continuing to build on these ideas to help you understand how God thinks, what his character is like, and how he judges. And so now we have to be careful. Paul is saying that God considers our works, and they are important to him. And he has even said, he said last week in the passage we looked at, that self-seeking people will meet with God's wrath and those who seek God's glory will find eternal life. But he is only really speaking in generalizations and theoretically to this point because he's building these arguments. I want to be really clear. He has not said that anyone actually can live so perfectly that they will be justified before God in doing this. Okay, There's a difference between nuance in judgment and then being justified by God by your works. That, as you're going to see coming up, is not possible. That is not what happens. But for now, we should take comfort in the fact that God does exercise nuance in his judgment. When it comes to people who haven't had the law or the Bible, when it comes to people who haven't heard about Christ, God's judgment is going to take that into consideration in some way. And we'll talk more in detail about that as we continue through the series. We learned some baseline aspect of how God judges last week when we asked the question, how will God judge people? And these are six things that we saw from last week's passage. It will be based on truth. It will be according to people's works. It will be impartially. It will be with nuance. It will be according to the gospel. And then most importantly, it will be by Jesus Christ. And so these are some general things that we saw about how God judges. The more that we go into this, the more clarity we are going to get as we progress. And today, Paul is going to continue to build on that last uh, level that we just looked at, talking about the nuance of God's judgment. And today, he's going to address the Jews specifically, because this requires a little bit of nuance for us to understand how does God judge between Jews and Gentiles? Like, what is the difference? So the question of the day, and every week we're having a question of the day, that we're highlighting, the question of, today, of the day is, do God's chosen people get a free pass? All right, we're going to start chapter 2, verse 17. If you want to turn there in your Bible, and we're encouraging everyone to bring a Bible, bring highlighters and pens and mark up that Bible. It's good to do, all right? And we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 17 today. We're going to talk about the fact that God looks at the heart, not at labels, all right? In fact, in verses 17 to 20, we'll read these few verses first, Paul calls out the Jews and he lists all of the privileges that they have had as God's chosen people here. But also, tongue-in-cheek, he's going to take shots at them for making certain assumptions about what that means as it relates to how God judges them. All right, so let's take a look at this, starting at verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, then you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Let's just kind of stop there for the moment. I want to break this down, because he's going to kind of highlight all of these different privileges that the Jews have had as it relates to God. So in verse 17, so he says, so if you call yourself a Jew, now the word Jew originally, just so you know, it referred to a person from the region um, occupied by the tribe of Judah, specifically within that land that we know as Israel when we look on a map. After the exile, it became applied to all Israelites who occupied that territory and a little bit more of territory as that territory expanded. In Paul's day, here as he is writing, the word Jew was a designation for anyone who belonged to the people of Israel, all right? So just so you understand, that term Jew, it kind of evolved over time. When you go back in the Old Testament, you're referring to God's people, you actually really shouldn't use the term Jew because that term didn't come along until much later. And so when I'm speaking of Jews in the Old Testament, I try to use the term Israelite, all right? All right? 
And that's just a designation because the term Jew didn't come along until uh, much later. All right? So it's just something to be aware of. But he's saying if you call yourself a Jew, now he's going to list off a number of different privileges that they've had. He says in verse 17 that you rely on the law and boast in God. Now we know that the Jews had a certain pride about being God's enlightened people, right? They had received the law from God. They had the mind of God in a specific way, not just general revelation like we talked about, but this special revelation, God giving his specific thoughts on things. They had this in the law, and so they boasted about that. The Jews really saw themselves as kind of being at a higher level when it came to that. Verse 18, it says, if you know his will, well, of course, the law contained God's will, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Jews practiced it, does it? We know many times in reading stories in the Old Testament that they didn't always practice what was in the law. Also in verse 18, he says, if you approve what is excellent. Now, they should have been able to approve what is excellent because they had the law. They knew the details. They had the specific instructions of what they were supposed to do. But again, from their history, we know that they often failed to do it. Again, in verse 18, he says, if you've been instructed from the law. Again, they didn't just have the law, but they were regularly taught in the law. And even the Jews at this time that Paul is talking to, they had regular times where they spent time in the law. They memorized the law. Like, they knew this very well. It wasn't just that they had received it. They were constantly in it and studying it. So they were instructed in the law. He then calls them a blind, a guide to the blind in verse 19. But before he uses that term, notice what he says there in verse 19. He starts with, are you sure that you yourselves are a guide to the blind? I love how he words that. So they had this privilege of being able to guide the blind if they wanted to. They had God's word. But you see, the Jews saw themselves this way, but we know that they often didn't live up to being guides for the blind. And Jesus condemned the Jewish, the Jewish religious leaders shortly before, you know, this time of Paul writing this book. He criticized them harshly in this regard. And you maybe remember that famous passage in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus proclaims seven woes on the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of and Pharisees, and he goes over and over, and he says all of these woes against them. And in that passage, he uses the word blind five times. He says, woe to you, blind guides. It's the same language that we're seeing Paul use here. You blind fools, he says. You blind men. You blind guides a second time. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel, Jesus said. And then finally, he uses the phrase blind Pharisee as he's pronouncing these woes on them in Matthew 23. And so, remember, Paul has all of this in his mind. He knows the teaching of Jesus. And so he's saying, you guys are supposed to be a guide to the blind, but you're pretty blind guides. It's kind of what we're reading between the lines. Then in verse 19, a light to those in darkness. Again, this is preceded by the question, are you sure that you are a guide to the blind and a light to those in darkness? should be noted that Paul was actually using language here that the Jews would have been familiar with from Isaiah when Isaiah, the prophet, spoke to Israel. Again, these guys knew these passages. They memorized these scriptures. Isaiah chapter 42, I am the Lord. I have called you, Israel, he's speaking to, in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind. That's the exact language that Isaiah used. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. So if you're taking notes, write down there in the margin, Isaiah 42, 6 to 7. This is a great parallel passage that shows what Paul's thinking here. They were supposed to be a light for people in darkness and a guide to the blind, but we know that they failed often in that. Then in verse 20, we see an instructor of the foolish. The Jews loved to instruct the Gentiles on what they didn't know. They considered the Gentiles foolish. They were ignorant. They did not know God's law. And that was a source of pride for the Jews. And so they considered them foolish, and Paul's using language that they would use. You're an instructor to the foolish. And then also in verse 20, you're a teacher of children. The, Gentiles treated, or the, the Jews treated Gentiles like children. That's basically what he's saying here. They 
treated them as being ignorant. And you can sense that Paul is mocking them a bit here for being so condescending toward Gentile people. Then he says, having the law, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth in verse 20. Well, they actually did have the knowledge and the truth given to them in the law. And the word embodiment makes me smile. It's the word morphosis in Greek. And it is a great translation, that word embodiment, but the Jews saw the law as the embodiment of the truth, which is, which is great. But ironically, when Jesus, God's son, who took on human morphe, form, embodiment, when he came, they failed to see him as the embodiment, the greatest embodiment of truth and knowledge. Isn't that ironic? In John chapter 1, the Word was the true light. He became flesh. He exuded the glory of the one sent from the Father. He was the fullest embodiment of the truth, right? In Hebrews, it talks about how in times past, through the prophets, we learn these things about God. But in this present day, we have learned through His Son, right? He is the embodiment of the truth and of knowledge. And so the Jews missed the greatest embodiment of truth. They had all of the knowledge through the law, the prophets. They should have seen him coming, but didn't. And so they missed out. And this goes along with what Paul later is going to teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And so this is just a dynamic that we know to be true about knowledge. The Jews had a lot of knowledge. They knew more than the Gentiles by far in terms of who God was, what God desired of humankind. But that knowledge, instead of being turned into love, it, it just puffed them up. And this is why we say what we do in this series. We said it last week. God is not as interested in what you know as he is in what you do with what you know. And so wherever you're at in your walk with God, God's mostly inter interested in are you doing something with what you know to be true? We're always hungry to learn more. Sometimes God wants us to press pause on that, I think, so that we can actually put into practice the things that we do know. And this was a real problem for the Jews, and it can be a real problem for us today as well. Like, we have so much access to things when it comes to studying the Bible. Like, we take it for granted. We have so much opportunity, especially being English-speaking in the world. We have more resources than anyone in the world. It's crazy. Like we have access to sermons and to Bible studies and books, YouTube videos, podcasts. But being a hearer of the word does not guarantee that we will be a doer of the word, as James so rightly pointed out. Well, Paul is going to ask some pointed questions here to the Jews in his audience. And again, he's going to use this interlocutor kind of uh, dynamic where he's posing questions to this imaginary person in sort of a diatribe to kind of build this argument that he's making. And it's interesting, the Greek philosopher Epictetus, who actually comes after Paul in time, after the time of him writing this book, he spoke in a similar, similar way when he contested the claim of some Stoics to be true Stoics. Um, Epictetus actually said that they weren't true Stoics because they did not live according to the philosophy of the Stoics. And, and he spoke in this same sort of way in a diatribe, defending this idea. And now Paul is basically, we're seeing here, using that, exam, that exact same type of language. So Epictetus might have actually borrowed this uh, from Paul in terms of the way he expressed it. Just something to check out in history. But here Paul challenges the Jews in the very same way. The Jews were proud to wear the label of God's chosen people. They still are today. But that didn't mean that they were obeying God from the heart. As Douglas J. Moo, the theologian, writes, he says, All the privileges, distinctions, and gifts that the Jewish people may claim are meaningless if they are not responded to with a sincere and consistent obedience. And it is just this obedience that is lacking. And that's what we see so often in the history of Israel. And Paul is going to pose four pointed questions here to expose the disobedient heart of many of the Jews. Not all. We know that there were Jews that did respond to God in faith, and we see testimony of that. Paul even records some of their names in this book. But 
the majority of Jews were not, and Paul is going to ask four pointed questions here. The first one is in verse 21. He says, you then who teach others, do you teach yourself? And this kind of goes along with the age-old adage that we continue to use today, and that is, do you practice what you preach, right? And it's a great adage. It's something that forces us to think, am I being a hypocrite? Am I actually doing the things that I say that I believe in? The mentality is, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Well, we have lots of people that give that example. That's not what we need. This is just hypocrisy. The second statement he makes is, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? Now, we're not sure what specific theft he might be referring to here, but we may see a hint of it in the next verse when we get there. But Paul is definitely, again, addressing hypocrisy. That seems to be the key theme that's running through these questions. It's, it's kind of like, you know, if you, those of you that use the internet a lot, if you steal a meme from someone and then, you know, then that seems okay, but then someone steals it from you and you get all upset, right? Kind of like Kermit here, right? It's, it's okay when you steal it, but then someone steals it from you. And it's like, oh, right? Well, this is kind of the same level of hypocrisy that Paul is exposing here. The third one in verse 22, we see, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? We can't really know how rampant actual adultery was among these Jews that he's talking to here. Maybe Paul is playing off of Jesus' newer definition of adultery that he shared in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where he said, if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. But everyone in his audience would have been familiar with Jesus' teaching on that. And so I'm sure that they were feeling some guilt when Paul asks this question. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And then the fourth one, he says, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now, the natural question here is, okay, well, what, what temples are you talking about? Which temples were some of these Jews maybe robbing? The ESV study Bible actually suggests that Paul is referring to Jews stealing not from their own temples, but from pagan temples here, which actually makes a lot of sense in context because he's talking about you who abhor idols, right? Where would you find idols? Well, you would find them in pagan temples. You're not going to find those in the Jewish temples. You're going to find those in pagan temples. So he says, you who abhor, uh, who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And so maybe they were stealing from pagan temples. You can imagine the Jews giving themselves permission to steal from a pagan temple after all, which often housed expensive articles that could then be easily sold for money. It's very likely that there were people doing that at this time. And this aligns with the thought that Paul just made about them preaching against stealing, but doing it anyway, right? We just talked about that in the previous verse. And so this kind of makes sense. It goes together. Either way, the summary is the same in verse 23. He says, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. That's the bottom line. You're living as hypocrites. You boast in the law. You say, oh, this law is so great, but you're actually breaking the same law. Paul doesn't really need to say any more. In these quick examples, he's even mentioned a couple of the Ten Commandments, right? Stealing and adultery are both in the commandments. The very law that they took pride in was actually exposing their sinfulness and their obedience. So they're, they're boasting about this law that, make, you know, that they have because they're God's people, but that very same law is exposing just how disobedient they are. And the Jews had to admit that they were lawbreakers, just like the Gentiles. And that is the big point that Paul is making. Don't lose the bigger picture. He's talking here about judgment. He's saying that, no, you don't get a free pass as God's chosen people, right? You do the same things, you break the law, just like Gentiles do, even though you have the law, you're breaking it. In verse 24, he says, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, Paul is loosely quoting from the Old Testament. There's no one specific verse that says those exact words, but there's a few places where this idea comes through very strong, which we're pretty sure he was you know, kind of loosely quoting here. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. It says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. You see that same language? 
the Israelites had profaned the name of Yahweh among the nations. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the nations, because of you. So Paul is showing clearly that the Jews are no different from their forefathers. They're consistently sinful, just like Jews of the past and just like Gentiles of the past and present. And so they don't get any special favor from God when it comes to their sin. And when God says that he will judge impartially and according to our works, this applies to Jew and Gentile alike. And we saw that in the passage last week. We're seeing it explained in more detail here today. Now, someone might say, but God had something special with the Jews, right? Going way back to Abraham, specifically circumcision is what gets brought up here. What was circumcision for if it didn't show that God had a special relationship and a special covenant or agreement with Israel? And so let's pick it up at verse 25 as he gets into this part of the discussion. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written code, who have the written code of circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So let's go through here. Verse 25, he says that circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But then he immediately follows that up by saying, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. What does he mean by that? Well, what he means is if you break the law, you're no different from uncircumcised people. You're no different from the goyim, from the Gentiles that you're trying to distinguish yourself from, is what he's saying. And then in verse 26, he gets to the heart of God and his fairness in judgment. When Paul affirms that an uncircum- uncircumcised Gentile who keeps the law pleases God as much as one of his own people who keeps the law. Right? And maybe even more, because he didn't even have the law, but he's keeping it. In verse 27, Paul goes as far as to say that such a person will condemn those Jews who are circumcised physically, but who break the law connected with that symbol. It's like, you Jews, you have this symbol, right? But you're breaking the law. These guys don't have the symbol, and they're keeping the law. Their actions are condemning you. So we see there in verse 28, where he's kind of summing it up, he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. So that's kind of a key verse in this section. You might want to highlight that whole verse. That's kind of what's summarizing this section. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Paul is letting us in here on the heart of God. He says that the point of circumcision was never about the physical aspect. It was always about the spiritual significance. And the Jews were slow to understand that. This actually resonates with what the Jews learned when God chose King David, right? If you go back into Old Testament scriptures and you study it out, they should have understood that this is how God thinks. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, When David was being chosen as king, you'll remember that Samuel went in and he actually saw Eliab, who was David's brother, who was quite impressive. And Samuel warns him, the Lord said to Samuel, or the the Lord warned Samuel because Samuel was impressed here. He says, do not look on Eliab's appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so Jews should have understood David was their hero. They knew the story of David very well. They knew from that story the way that God looks at people, that he looks on them from the heart. So they should have also understood that circumcision, true circumcision, is of the heart. This is what God is looking for. So note this, God is the perfect judge, and he is because he alone knows the heart. You can write that statement down. God knows the heart. This is why he is the perfect judge. Judge. 
That's why we can have confidence in God's judgment. You see, we as humans, the best that we can do is what Jesus said, you know them by their fruit. That's the best that we can do. We see what people do, the way that they live their lives, and we you know, kind of evaluate where people are at on that basis. It's not always accurate, right? We know that. But God judges from the heart. He knows what's really going on. He judges at a deeper level. Verse 29, he says, A true Jew is one inwardly, and that circumcision is of the heart. A person truly circumcised in the heart, he says, lives by the spirit of the law, not by the letter of the law. We live by the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not by the letter of the law. You know, there are times where the written word cannot give us the nuance we need in making judgment. We understand this even in our legal system. It's interesting that, you know, even in our legal system, it considers this aspect of the Judeo-Christian perspective in judging. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but for a person to be charged under our criminal law, the prosecution has to prove what's called in Latin mens rea. Right? If you've ever taken a law class, this is how it works. You have to be able to prove for a criminal charge in Canada that there is mens rea. That is the guilty mind. That they knew what they were doing. Right? You have to be able to prove that. And this is a more nuanced form of judgment, which we're really blessed that we have that in our criminal code, that there is nuance to it. That nuance actually comes from this, from a biblical Judeo-Christian perspective. If a person literally doesn't know what they are doing, then they cannot be charged criminally. Now, in today's world, defense attorneys often try to misuse this, right, and to demonstrate that the defendant was out of their mind, or I love this one, right, temporarily insane, which is the most convenient excuse for absolutely any activity that you ever want to do. Temporary insanity is awesome, right? Sorry, I was just really insane in that moment, right? It's not to say that that could ever happen, but we know that it gets overused. But it all applies to this idea of mens rea, of a guilty mind. But no one is going to be able to play these kind of lawyer games with God. Aren't you happy about that? No one's going to be able to manipulate God or try to fool him when it comes to his judgment, because God really knows what's going on in a person's heart. On Friday night, I went to see a movie, kind of on a whim, and I invited my friend Chris Markham to come, and he said yes. So we're like, yeah, that's cool. So we went to see a movie, and the movie was called After Death. Anyone heard of this one? Anyone seen it yet? Okay, it's by Angel Studios. It's the same group that puts out The Chosen, all right? And I was very interested in seeing this because for many years I've been very interested in uh, stories of near-death experiences, and that's really what the movie is about. In fact, some of you may remember way back that I did a series at Easter called Afterlife. I remember Pastor Nathan going, this is really weird, what are you getting into here? But I was reading a bunch of books by Raymond Moody and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and some of these ones that had done study over many years on and collected stories of people that had had these near-death experiences. And I found it fascinating because as you get into these stories, what you actually see is a lot of what they say that they experience when they flatline, right? This is what it's all about. And this movie shows tons of stories that people who flatline, right, either through cardiac arrest or they were in a big accident or something, and they, they, their spirit goes off from their body. And they have these experiences, and then they come back and they tell about them and how these experiences line up amazingly with what the Bible says and how it describes what goes on after death. Well, it's very fascinating. I would encourage you to, to go check out the movie. It's, it's, it's very interesting. One of the common aspects, there's a number of common aspects that they identify, and they've been identifying them from years, going, going way back to Raymond Moody. Um, he put them in categories of the things that people experience. And not everyone does, but there are some general categories that a lot of people hit when they're having these near-death experiences. One of them is immediately they kind of have this out-of-body experience. Many of them float above their body. They can look down and see people working on them. They can actually tell about things that happened that they should not have been able to know about because they literally, they had no brain waves and are totally flatlined. No heartbeat, no brain waves. They can describe things that were going on, even talk about medical language they had no knowledge of. In one story I read years ago, um, the person's bo- they floated up above the hospital And they looked down and they saw a red shoe on top of the hospital. When they came back into their body, a couple of days later, they said, oh yeah, by the way, there's a red shoe on the roof. They went up and verified and found the red shoe. 
So it's really crazy because it's actually a scientific way of demonstrating stuff that we were never able to prove that our consciousness lasts beyond our body. So it's crazy stuff, but it's actually using science to show what we've known to be true all along. And so you're going to see so many stories in this movie. I encourage you to check it out. A lot of you are like, oh, I need to see this now. Good. But one of the common aspects, they have this out-of-body experience. A lot of them will go through a tunnel. Then they come into this amazing light, and they feel what they describe as being unconditional love. It's the presence of God. Music and colors like nothing we've experienced on earth. Many of them see gates. They go up to the gates. Some get inside the gates. Many of them meet Jesus. Even people in other cultures that had no understanding of Christianity describe him as Christ. They meet loved ones that they had met before. Some of you are familiar with Don Piper's book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. He's in the movie. They talk about his whole story. It's pretty interesting stuff, but one of the common elements is what is known as the life review, where in a very quick frame of time, everything from that person's life flashes before their eyes. You hear people telling this before when, they, when they're in accidents, how this sometimes happened. I saw all of this stuff flash before my eyes. This is an even a more profound way when they're in this kind of limbo state. And they see everything that they did, good and bad. And there's sort of this, this very fast but accurate judgment of their life that is taking place in this moment. It's very interesting, and it kind of goes along here with what we're seeing in this passage from Paul, where it describes the fact that God knows our hearts. I said last week, how will this judgment take place, right? I, I often wonder, what will, what will it look like? Remember the chick comic book? tracts years ago, this was your life, and you stand there watching a video of your life, and you get creeped out because it's showing all the bad stuff you did. I don't know what it's going to look like. Maybe it's more like this life review, where God just reveals to you all at once, in a moment, you see it all, your life. God's judgment will be perfect, and he knows our hearts. He's not depending on anyone else's testimony. He knows your heart. Well, We've been talking about outward rites and rituals and how some people try to depend on those to protect them somehow from God's judgment. It's not just Jews that do this, by the way. It's human nature. People do this everywhere. Even Christians, we do this. We depend on rites and rituals. We think if we do enough of these good churchy kind of things that God has to be lenient toward us on that day of judgment. You know, we've also been given a right that's very similar to circumcision as Christians. You know what it is? Baptism, right? It's very similar. It's an outward ritual of some inward reality that's supposed to have taken place. I know Christians who have reasoned that because they were baptized that God would give them a free pass or at least some kind of special consideration. God, you, you're going to have to overlook these things that I've done because I was baptized, right? No, that's not how it works. It's not how it works, and I hope that you're seeing that clearly from today's passage. Baptism, like circumcision, is an outward symbol of what is supposed to have been an inward reality, and if true circumcision is of the heart, like Paul is saying, then I think it's safe to say that true baptism is also of the heart, right? God wants us to do the physical act, but there's, there needs to be the spiritual reality behind it. It's just an outward symbol of an inward commitment that we've made to God. Now, there is value to these outward symbols. If not, God would never have given them to us. He wouldn't have given circumcision to the Jews. He wouldn't have given baptism to us as Christians. There's value in these things. In some way, they help us sort of get clarity on our commitment that we're making and take it more seriously. I really think that. And if you're someone who claims to follow Jesus and you've never been baptized, you need to do it. The Bible is pretty clear about that. And you should do it as soon as you can. You should get baptized. But understand, these rites, they do not distort God's sense of judgment, right? You don't get some free pass because of that. Have you publicly professed your faith through baptism? If so, does your life match up with your profession? You made a public declaration, I'm following Jesus. Maybe that was last week. Maybe that was many years ago. But would people say that your life matches up 
with the profession that you made. Israel has had many privileges. That's what Paul's talked about in this whole passage. So many privileges. Guess what? As the church, so have we. Even more, because we're on this side of Christ, right? We've had even more privilege. And so the big idea I want you guys to get, privilege doesn't lessen your accountability. This is what Paul's telling the Jews here. It doesn't lessen your accountability. It increases it. You're more accountable to God because of these advantages that you've been given. Some of us have been blessed to know God and taught about him. What are we doing with that? Well, as we wrap up, our question of the day is, do God's chosen people get a free pass? You know, it's a timely question given everything that's happening in the Middle East right now, isn't it? It's a very timely question. Israel has a special relationship with God as his chosen people. I don't think there's anyone here that would deny that. Now, there are competing views when it comes to Israel and the church and all of that, and we're going to get into those uh, discussions in chapters 10 and 11, so be patient. We will get to those, and we'll treat them uh, more thoroughly. But for now, I will tell you that here at Renew and in the fellowship that we're a part of, we believe that the church and Israel are distinct, but that we obviously have a special relationship. We're going to talk about this grafting in idea, how we're part of the same root uh, as we get into chapters 10 and 11. So we, we believe that the church and Israel are distinct, but we have a special relationship. We believe that God is going to keep the promises that he's made to Israel. And we believe that the Israel that receives these promises will be a distinct national entity, but also a spiritual entity, united with the church when Israel as a nation comes to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And it's a very in-depth study, and we're going to get into some of that, like I say, when we get further into this book. Dr. Randy Smith, who is uh, the professor who teaches uh, with our GCBI North program, is a great student uh, of the Word and has lived in Israel a good part of his life. Dr. Smith has a great video where he explains that in the Bible, we see that God has a bride, and that bride is Israel. And you can actually study that out in the Old Testament. Many times, God's bride, God's bride Israel, is called his bride. And then you get to the New Testament, and God's son, Jesus, has a bride. Who's that? Church, right? And that's us. And here's the thing. Both of these brides have been guilty of unfaithfulness, correct? <laughs> yep, <laughs> very much so. But both will be the people of God, and we're going to cover all of this. For now, I always try to be really careful the way that I speak about God's bride. <laughs> I just think that that's a wise thing to do, right? She's not perfect. We've seen today she does not get a free pass. Not as individual Jews in relation to sin, not as a nation state. She doesn't get a free pass. And God has no problem judging her when he needs to. He has severely in the past. If you've studied your Old Testament, you will know this. If you've studied history, you will know this. But she is still God's bride, and God has provided the Messiah through her, and God still has special plans for her. I also think we need to be adequately studied and measured before we speak too much into this current conflict that's taking place in the Middle East. I think we need to be judicious in our assessments and really calculate the effectiveness of any words that we decide to share. I think that's wisdom. We definitely need to be loving and compassionate and gracious toward everyone who is suffering as a result of what's happening. And most of all, as we said earlier in the service, we need to pray for the salvation of Jews and Palestinians alike. Both need to come to God. Both need to find their way into his kingdom. God loves them all and wants to see them in his kingdom. I want to wrap up before we have bread and cup together. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 gives an amazing snapshot, and this is what we hold on to. This is what we look forward to, regardless of our differences and, and regardless of the confusion that we experience in these issues. We're looking forward to a day when all people from all different tribes and languages and tongues stand before God in worship of him 
And look at what it says in Revelation 7, 9. I don't have it there, but listen to this verse. It says, After I looked, this is John speaking, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And he describes how they're worshiping God together. It's an amazing picture, and it's what we look forward to in the fulfillment of God's kingdom. Until then, in the middle of all the craziness, we have to be reminded that God is still in control. We don't need to freak out. God's in control. He's leading history to a certain place. There is a course to history. It's leading somewhere, and we've been blessed. We're privileged as the people of God to know what's coming, even if in general strokes we can live with confidence knowing what's coming. And so I want to take a minute and just pray and ask God to bless these ideas, these thoughts to our hearts today. And then Aaron Harris is going to come up and lead us in bread and cup. Father, thank you so much for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the clarity that Paul is giving here, even as it relates to your chosen people. Thank you, Lord, for your consistency as the judge of the universe, that even with chosen people, it doesn't go higher than your baseline character and how you judge people. Lord, you expect all of us to respond to you in obedience to the knowledge that you have given to us. And Lord, we stand before you today as people who also have been greatly privileged to know your word, to have knowledge of Christ. Many of us too, who have come to embrace him by faith and continue to study your word in depth and with all kinds of study aids and teachers and so much opportunity. And yet, Lord, it doesn't necessarily change the way that we live. So I pray that you would convict us today over that and that you would help us to see that you are way more interested in what we do with what we know than just with what we know. To help us, Lord, not to be guilty of pride. Help us not to boast in anything but in Christ in whom we find forgiveness, in whom we find this justification that we're going to be talking about in the upcoming weeks. Lord, we do continue to pray for what's going on in Israel and in Palestine. Lord, we know your will is good for all those that you've created. And so we pray that everyone everywhere would submit to your goodness and to your love and to your will and to Christ and that they would be found in your kingdom. Help us to be faithful to continue to pray to this end until we see your return. In Jesus' name. Join us every Sunday at 4 p.m. at 7755 10th Line West in Mississauga. Or visit us online at renewchurch.ca slash connect.